1977. Wow, that is awesome. Yeah, <laughs> well, moving on. <laughs> you have Eli Friedman. Anybody know him? Yeah, he was he was my he was one of the greatest teachers I have here. Yeah. Um, as I said, Kings County was the most fun, especially G Building. It doesn't exist anymore. Oh my God! What I saw there, I have never seen again. <laughs> no, it's now supportive housing. So it was interesting. It was great. I only got I only got somebody pulled a gun on me. But he was, you know, he calmed down. <laughs> so then I went to St. Vincent's for my internship and residency, and then I worked for a while as an emergency room doctor and then I went to uh, do my fellowship. I did three-year fellowship in, in geriatrics at Mount Sinai, and I was on the full-time faculty there for forever, <laughs> including now. Um, but I am the vice chair of medicine and the director of geriatrics, and I do spend pretty much all day at Maimonides for the past, I don't know, 10, 12 years, okay? So I also, um, as part of my Jerry Fellowship, did a lot of training in palliative care. And actually, before you, you uh, had to do a fellowship to take the palliative care boards, I actually took the palliative care boards. And as you can see, that in Mount Sinai, they have sort of combined it into one program. Um, a lot of places, including Maimonides, it's completely separate. Palliative care, its own division. Um, but um, I cer certainly firmly believe that a geriatrician should do their own palliative care and should not need to call a palliative care consult. Um, so does everyone here, could any, everyone here easily explain the difference to me or to anyone between palliative care and hospice? Is that at all confused in anyone's mind? Hospice is a Medicare benefit that you can obtain, as you say, if you have less than six months to live. But conceptually, does anybody have a full, clear understanding of the differences? Okay, well, then we have a lot to talk about, so that's good. I don't like boring people. <laughs> Okay, so, ah, great. So the objectives today are to understand the Palliative Care Information Act and the Palliative Care Access Act, which are re sort of recent in the past few years, as well as the Family Health Care Decisions Act and MULST. Does everybody know what a MULST is? It's that form of the DNA. You guys, it says pink, hot pink papers, right? And they're really big and important now. I. Unfortunately, forgot to bring an example, but you have some up there. Can you get, get one out? Yeah, that would be great. Um, so, and then we're going to learn about how to talk to people about later. Great. Oh, I'm so happy you had that here. Um, how to talk to people about palliative care and the, really the big differences between palliative care and hospice. And this is a very small group, so feel free to interrupt me at any time. So there are many definitions for palliative care, and this one um, is the World Health Organization's definition. So palliative care is an approach that improves the quality of life of patients and their families facing the problems associated with life-threatening illness through the prevention and relief of suffering by means of early identification and impeccable assessment and treatment of pain and other problems, physical, psychosocial, and spiritual. I love this definition. Does this have anything to do with six months or hospice? No. Can you be 20 years away from death and get need palliative care? Yes. So that's the big, big difference. And when you mention palliative care to families, they already think death, you're, you're trying to kill me. And we really need to get away from that notion because there's been a lot of research actually showing that, for example, cancer patients 
who, who simultaneously get chemotherapy and palliative care actually can live longer. There was a landmark study probably, I think around 2010 in, in the New England Journal by somebody named Tamel on lung cancer patients. And the ones that got simultaneous palliative care actually lived longer than the ones that just got chemo. Why is that? Less pain, less stress, better outlook, all of that, you know, you guys know body and mind are not in a separate, two separate things. So this is palliative care um, and a great definition of it. So healthcare treatment, and it's usually interdisciplinary. It's, it's very time consuming and we usually involve social workers, nurses, and other, as well as family members and the patient, okay? So here is um, a table, it's a little bit um, tedious, um, actually from Sean Morrison, who is a very well-known researcher in palliative care at Mount Sinai and one of my former fellows actually. So j just looking at this a little bit, model of care, palliative care is, they're both interdisciplinary teams and they both have a goal of in improving quality of life and relief of suffering. Um, patients or anyone's eligible for palliative care, whereas as you said, for um, hospice benefit, which is a Medicare benefit, the doctor needs to say that in his or her opinion, the person has a prognosis of six months or less. So that's your opinion. If the patient happens to live longer, no one's gonna come shoot you. <laughs> and you can actually, the patient if necessary, can be recertified. Now, there have been a few patients that have um, been um, discharged from hospice because somehow they got better. You know, we're not able to necessarily get that right. But I have several patients that have been on hospice for a few years because they kept getting recertified because they met the criteria for recertification. Um, and we'll go over a little bit more detail some of the criteria for some of the illness. Is it only for cancer? No, you, it started out really as for cancer many, many years ago. Um, and that's another problem that people think it's only for cancer. Um, but it is for any end stage illness, um, including uh, dementia and heart failure and other, other diseases. Um, the issue becomes like, how do you determine, it's much easier to say to a cancer patient that has mess all over their body that, yeah, you're gonna, yeah, probably not gonna live more than six months. And we have a lot of data on different types of cancer, like pancreatic cancer, let's say. And it's, it's not so easy to determine when somebody's gonna die from dementia. So that, that becomes a problem. But most of the um, current studies are showing that we're not referring to hospice soon enough, and the patients aren't getting that benefit soon enough. And um, most patient, people are getting referred in the last few days of life. And really, we should be thinking about it sooner. Um, so palliative care usually um, is a hospice. We call palliative care consults in the hospital. Usually, we think patients are getting too much aggressive care or they came in septic or acutely ill, and we want to sort of start reassessing the goals of care for that patient. And that's usually when palliative care gets involved. There aren't that many outpatient palliative care clinics. There are anesthesia and pain clinics, and pain is a big part of palliative care, but it's not the only part of palliative care because palliative care encompasses a lot of things about what are someone's values? What are their goals for their life, et cetera? So, um, but hospice is mostly delivered in the home. And I think that's a wonderful thing because pa patients do want to die at home. They don't want to die in the hospital and they're much more comfortable at home. But there are inpatient hospice units, but there are criteria for when you might go to one and that usually that involves uncontrolled uncontrollable symptoms, uncontrollable pain, or the family can't deal with it at the very end. So they go to inpatient hospice for the very, very late stages of their illness. Do you have to be DNR?
to go to hospice. No, that's not, there's only, no. The only rule is six months prognosis. Specific, and, and that's, that's, that's part of the problem is that um, many cultural, different cultural groups are saying, oh, well, I don't want to be DNR, and they miss out on the hospice benefit. Now, it's a whole conversation. Why don't you want to be DNR? What are your goals of care? Um, but that's not a criteria in and of itself. Okay? Some hospice make it a criteria because they don't want to take patients who want more aggressive care because it's going to cost them more money. So each hospice gets a certain amount of money per patient, so they're looking to spend the least amount on each patient. So if somebody wants more and more aggressive care, that's not somebody they're going to be looking for. But that's not, that's not the law. So um, moving on to the next slide. So we'll go through this. So what are the different things that we need to talk about in palliative care? There are the physical, psychological, social, Spiritual is very big. So that's another thing that hospice can be very, very beneficial. This is palliative care, but hospice always also has spiritual rabbis, priests, and they're very, very helpful to the family. They come to the home. A lot of them have different kinds of music or art therapy or relaxation therapy, and, and all those things are very, very helpful. Um, to the family and to the patient who's dying. Okay, now, so palliative care and disease-modifying therapies are not mutually exclusive, right? Is that clear? You can give chemo and you can give palliative care at the same time. Generally speaking, when you're in hospice, you're not going for disease-modifying treatment. If you're getting radiation therapy, it's for pain control of the cancer or shrinking of the cancer that's causing pain. It's not to cure the cancer. But you can be getting palliative care with the goal of curing your cancer. So that's clear now, I think, to everyone, right? Um, so in 2010, um, the Palliative Care Information Act was passed, and it became effective in February 2011. And what it said is that attending doctors and nurse practitioners are required to offer terminally ill patients information and counseling concerning palliative care and end-of-life options. Do you think that that's being done in your hospital? <laughs> it's a law. It doesn't mean that they have to accept it, but they have to know that it's available option to them. And why do they make that law? Because no, people are not getting adequate access to palliative care. That's why the, you know, the law went into effect. But people are ignoring it. And it's hard to enforce, um, but it's really important. Um, and, you know, you just have to make an offer and say, this is available to you. Um, it doesn't mean that you have to believe in it or that you, the patient has to accept it. So what if, if there's a conflict between um, your beliefs and the patient's beliefs? What happens? Let's say uh, the patient wants everything done and you're looking at a patient who is terminally ill for a multitude of reasons, and you feel that those requests, whatever they are, dialysis, surgery, are really not, not only are they futile, but they will um, actually be harmful and painful for the patient. What do you do? I would say after informing the patient of the benefit and the risk and the patient's mm -hmm. There's no correct answer, but that is correct. That is a, an approach that one can take, yes. Anybody have any other ideas? 
you're not required. So both of you were right. So what would you do in that situation? Right. You can you if you're that uncomfortable, you can you can offer another physician. But both of you are correct. Okay. If the patient lacks capacity to reasonably understand and make informed choices, the information shall be provided to a person with authority. So this is going back to the act. So you know, you can't walk up to a demented patient and say, Do you want palliative care? So you have to you know, you have to find either the surrogate or the healthcare proxy. Does everybody know the difference between a healthcare proxy and a surrogate? Healthcare proxy is legal in the surrogate. They're both legally defined. Sorry. Okay. So, a healthcare proxy, as you say, is a another term for that would be an advanced directive, where somebody who's clear of mind fills out any kind of paperwork or even verbally says to somebody, I want you to make decisions for me if and when I can't make decisions. So I have a healthcare proxy. I can get hit by a truck walking out of here and be temporarily even unable to make decisions. So it's not a matter of being 90 and you know, or being old. Everyone should have a healthcare proxy, every adult. And it's the person you trust who will make decisions that are consistent with your values and your wishes. So the healthcare proxy should know that you've appointed them. There's no place on the form that they have to sign that they agree to be the healthcare proxy. And they should know what your wishes are. So it's best to have a conversation because what happens if you don't have that conversation? They're probably going to make decisions that are whatever they think, or um, they're going to be afraid to limit care because they're going to think they're killing you and there's a lot of guilt involved. So you need to really be clear with whoever you trust what your values are and your wishes are. Now, you can't go for every situation. There are living wills, but they also are very confusing if you're ever looking at one and they don't account for every situation. So it's just best to give the person you choose a general sense of who you are and what your values are, and then they could act accordingly. Um, most people, even though the healthcare proxy law has been in effect since the 1980s, have not appointed a healthcare proxy. So, the, more recently in the 1990s, because so few people had health care proxies, the surrogate law went into effect, which is, as you say, there's a hierarchy of who then can make decisions. So if you have, I could appoint you as my health care proxy. It doesn't have to be my, my, my sister or my husband. It could be anyone I want. But if you haven't done that, it goes in the hierarchy of spouse, children, and uh, there's a slide about that. So if somebody is appointed and doesn't want to do it, then what? Uh, you find out that I've appointed you and you go, oh, no. What? <laughs> <laughs> just how can you make me responsible? I mean, if I wouldn't want to do it, how could I be responsible for something? Agree you. Yeah, you don't have to. You could say, I I'm uncomfortable. I'm not going to do this. Um, and then it would default to the surrogate. And then if there's nobody, then it would default to the two physicians in the hospital. But so you're not obligated, but hopefully, you know, you'll want to do it. Um, and there's a place on the form of the proxy to pick two people. So who's ever willing, if either of them. There's one thing that a proxy can't make decisions on because when the law went into effect, I think it was 1981, the church said that everybody has the right to food and nutrition, everyone. And unless you specifically state, and if you look at any proxy form, I don't know if you have any here in the shelf, if you look at any form, you will see in very small letters, it says at the bottom of the first page, unless your proxy knows your wishes about food and nutrition, they will not be able to make that decision. And there's a space to write in, my proxy knows my wishes. If that's not written, feeding tube, feeding tube city. <laughs>
On the other hand, surrogates do have a right to make those decisions. So they have broader rights than proxies. Okay, so it's all very confusing. Um, so as we just said, we're getting back to the uh, Palliative Care Information Act, that if a practitioner may arrange for another professionally qualified individual to provide this information or to transfer the care of the patient. And you can be doing this in or orally or writing. So it turns out if you don't do this, you can go to jail and get a fine for $5,000. Does anybody? I've never seen that enforced, although I know a lot of people I'd like to enforce it on. <laughs> Okay, so now the next thing that went into effect was the Palliative Care Access Act. The first one was the Information Act, okay? And it builds on the Palliative Care Information Act and it went into effect in September 2011. And this one applies directly to healthcare facilities, home care agencies, assisted living and individual doctors and nurse practitioners and other DOs, whatever. Um, it applies to patients with advanced life-limiting conditions and illnesses who might benefit for pa from palliative care and not just those who are terminally ill. So it's a broader law. And, um, and it, it's not only one that you have to offer information, but you must facilitate access to appropriate palliative care consultation and services, also pain management services. So it takes it one step further. If the patient accepts, access to the services must, uh, must be facilitated by the provider. And again, if you don't want to, you have to transfer the patient. Now, what if the patient lacks capacity? Then the provider or the resident must provide counseling and information to whoever is legally authorized to make decisions, be it the healthcare proxy or the surrogate. What does it mean to lack capacity? How would you determine that? Okay, so the main thing to keep in mind is that capacity is decision specific. So you can have the capacity to decide um, that you want, you know, cheese sandwich versus a hamburger, or you want one child over another child to be your healthcare proxy, but you may not have the decisional capacity to choose between uh, medical versus surgical treatment of your um, coronary artery disease. That's a much more complex decision. You'd have to understand all the risks and benefits of medical versus surgical treatment, where it seems like you know your children to say, I trust you, not you, so it's decision specific, that's number one. So, and you don't assess it by saying, uh, you know, are you Ori, what's today's date? <laughs> and where are we? And can you remember three words? Because you can decide that I want you, not you, and have no idea what year it is. And that's a reasonable decision because you know that person. So that's not how we assess capacity for the decision. We assess it by talking to someone. So I have a conversation. Um, and then you ask the person to repeat back to you what they understood from that conversation. And if they, under a general rule of thumb is if they understood two thirds of the conversation, they probably have adequate capacity to make that decision. Um, then there's consistency. So today I point you. So then, okay, you let it go. You're not sure. Come back the next day. Yes, the same question. Do you get the same answer or do you get something completely different? So you look for consistency over time when you're making important decisions. Then you think to yourself, is this a decision that a reasonable person will make? So if a person says, if you go to somebody and say, your appendix is about to burst, we need to operate. Oh no, 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 oh no. And they're perfectly healthy. Oh no, I, I don't want to have the scar. Is that a decision that a reasonable person, no. So you should begin to question the capacity if you sense that the decision is not one that a reasonable person would make. 
Okay. So it's, it's a complex thing. Do you need to call psychiatry? No. You all, every single one of you in this room should be able to make that assessment for himself or herself. There are some occasionally complex patients with psych illnesses, et cetera, that you might involve psychiatry, but this is a skill you should have as any physician. Okay? All right. Are there any dentists here? There used to be dentists here, too. Okay. All right. So um, the intent of the law, and now we're talking about the Access Act, is to ensure that patients are fully informed and empowered to make choices consistent with their own goals of care, wishes, and beliefs, and to optimize their quality of life. So it's not intended to limit options. So the same, you know, you can say, I want everything for whatever reason, or I want to live to a certain date because, a, you know, my granddaughter's getting married. So it, people always think of when we approach them about palliative care that we're trying to limit their options. We're really not. We're trying to get pe to understand people's values and goals of care. So, and it also encourages um, conversations. So we, I think, went over this, that it's, a, it's often appropriate to discuss palliative care with patients early in their disease and, um, uh, and, and under the circumstances of whatever the illness is. So this you can also have to pay and go to jail for if you don't do this, but I've never seen that happen. Um, so why do we need this? Because historically, doctors don't like to have these conversations. I don't know how many of you received any training to, at this point of how to have these conversations. Have you? OK, in the modern age of medicine, I, I got a lot of training in my fellowship, but none in medical school. And I would have hoped that by now, 40 years later, this would be part of the curriculum. Um, and, and I'm sad to hear that it, it's not. <laughs> because it's it's really important. You know, I always give I always love this example of and it, it just I can't get it out of my mind. I, I was doing a wound consult on a patient just recently, and um, in the next bed was a, a looked to be a very sick patient. The daughter sitting at the edge of the bed 24 hours a day, and I was you know I was coming in every day to do is just look at someone's wound. Uh, bed saw. And, um, and I observed one day that the other doctor comes in, pats the daughter on the shoulder. Mom's doing really well today. Her white count's down. And she smiles, the daughter. The mother's completely out to lunch. So I'm saying to myself, are you kidding me? Mom's doing really well? She looks 90% dead to me. <laughs> I don't, but I don't say anything. So she did, she was dead the next day. How are you prepared with this daughter? <laughs> she was hysterical, actually. And that also makes for lawsuits. <laughs> so we do a very poor job in, in and, and there are many reasons for that. Lack of training. We're uncomfortable prognosticating. The one patient we say, you're going to die soon, walks out of the hospital. <laughs> the next patient that um, you think is going to walk out of the hospital and you discharge dies at the doorstep. I mean, these things happen. <laughs> and so we're very uncomfortable. And, but there are ways to have these conversations. And, and you have to give a bigger picture of what's going on especially when you feel someone's towards their end of their life. You can't just go with the white count and the CAT scan report. <laughs> the conversation has to be bigger. Um, and the vast majority of studies have shown that dying patients want to know what their diagnosis and prognosis is. And so what happens when the daughter says, don't talk to my mother, you'll frighten her? What do you do? That's one thing. And 
um, how would you have that conversation with that mother if the daughter says, okay, you can talk to her, I need to be in the room too, what would you, what would you do if you try to like break bad news or tell her that, you know, she, her CAT scan showed a mass, how would you do it? Okay, so you, you sort of feel the patient out and you follow how much they want to know. So no, 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 I'm asking, I would probably ask the patient how much, how much now do you know about your situation? Yes, that's what, um, yes, I'm, I'm saying that's correct. Right. So you would start with, um, you had a CAT scan today. Would you like to know the results? I'm, this, you don't have to follow this example. I'm just giving you an example. And the patient may say, no, talk to my daughter. And then that's the end of the conversation. Or you could say, why not? But, you know, or you can just leave. Um, and then say, yes, I'd like to know. And then you can say, well, it showed, you know, a growth. And do you know what that is? Well, you, know, you just follow the lead as to how much information the patient wants to know. And then, of course, you want to, you know, do you have any questions? Do you understand what I said? And then, of course, every day there's a conversation. Because I, li I think that some people feel that, okay, we're going to get this family together, we're going to have a family meeting, and we're going to set up a plan, DNR, not DNR, blood test, no blood test, goals of care, values, hospice, home, and that's the end of it. But the patient's situation is dynamic and changes every single day, if not every single hour. So it's an, really an ongoing assessment, and the goals of care can change every single day. Um, and I think often we sort of set something up and that's it. But that's really not it. <laughs> so, um, keep, so, and the more people feel that you're interested in having a conversation, the more comfortable everyone is with the bad situation that we're all in. And I can tell you that it's very gratifying, even if the patient ends up dying, because it's, it's a better death for everyone involved. Um, okay, we already went over this slide. Um, and we already went over this slide. Okay, and this is the study I was telling you about earlier, the Tamel study that patients with terminal lung cancer receive palliative care, lived longer than those who only receive chemo. So what's a good death? I really believe that there's such a thing because look, we're all going to die. <laughs> it's how you die. So um, clearly pain and symptom management is key. I certainly don't want to die in pain and I doubt that anybody else does. <laughs> so what is the double effect? Do you know what that means when you're giving pain meds? <clears throat> no? Okay. So. Um, the double effect is that if you need to give, uh, you know, to, to control the pain, you want to give, you have to give a certain amount of meds, and that may increase the risk of that patient stop breathing or dying. But it is not your intent for that patient to die. You're just trying to control their pain. Then that's okay. That's really acceptable. Um, so. Clear decision, so making decisions about how to proceed with, with your healthcare team and trying to, as best you can, explain what's going to happen. I think patients, for example, with dementia, you know, well, mom's confused and they have dementia and we don't spend a lot of time in the office explaining what to expect as time goes on or even what the resources are to help them as a family. Um, it's really important that families have a chance to apologize to each other, to come to closure. You know, there's a lot of feuds that go on in families. And if that doesn't happen, the ones that are left behind alive are really can have a lot of problems, unresolved problems about that person's death. And so it's really important to encourage that kind of conversation. And often in hospice, for example, the, the spiritual people and the social workers are really good at encouraging that to happen. Um, okay, now, 
we went through this. So here's where the most comes in. Okay? If you can say to yourself, an illness, this person has an illness that I think will reasonably cause this person to die or in the next six months, or it would not surprise me in my mind if this patient died, that's a good person for a most. So what's, what is the difference between a MULST and an advanced directive? What's a key difference? No. You can, you can, no. A MULST is a doctor's order. An advanced directive does not have any doctor's signature. You might have witnessed it, but you're not, it's not your order. Okay? A MULST is a doctor's order. Many places the doctor has to sign. Okay, so what? It, when they call nine one one, they okay, so one. that's that's why. Okay. So a most first of all, most stands for medical orders for life sustaining treatment. So it doesn't mean don't do anything. It can mean do everything. It means nothing. It means this is a doctor's order, and this will tell the person what the patient wants for many different scenarios. Now, you know, as well as I know, that every time a patient comes to the hospital, you have to keep doing the DNR and the CPR, all those forms, every single hospitalization. And there was such a thing as home de do not resuscitate, but the ambulance driver didn't respect that, the emergency room didn't respect that, and every, every place you go, another form. So the forms were setting specific. This is a doctor's order that by law needs to be respected in every single setting, in the patient's home, in the ambulance, and in the ER. Why is it pink? So you don't forget about it. <laughs> it's really, that's the only reason. <laughs> but it doesn't have to be. A Xerox copy is um, fine. So when my patients have, I put them into the electronic medical record too. So, so it's a physician's order. That is the big difference. And then it goes through a lot of different scenarios about do you want to be resuscitated? Do you want to be electively intubated? Do you want to go to the hospital? Do you want to stay home? Do you want to have limited trials of IV fluids? Do you want to have feeding tubes? Do you want to have... Uh, Antibiotics, do you not want? And, and then, of course, there's space where you can write in anything you want. It's not limited to what's on this form. But what I think is really good about this form is it's, it's a conversation starter. Because oh, a lot of us can't get the words out of our mouth. Um, so this is a good sort of way to have a conversation. And it guides you along the different steps. But it is by no means necessarily life Limiting. Many people fill it out and say, I want you to do everything. I want to, you know, freeze me until you get the cure to my disease. <laughs> so, um, so I think this is very helpful. But it also needs to be updated. So when the patient has a change of status, you're supposed to be, you know, saying, you know, what the change was and, and signing it again. And... None of these things are necessarily everlasting. So whatever has the most, you change your mind, fine. You change your mind. We, we record that. You, do, you want, you don't want. So it, it's fluid. And, and you, we're supposed to respect, as, as providers, the most recent one. So many people also have a million healthcare proxies because they don't remember, and they point this one, they point that one. So the one that's most binding is the one that has the latest date on it. Okay, so if you guys want to look at this, pass it around. Um, so how do we define terminal illness? That's always a dilemma. So does a frail 100-year-old patient with dementia meet the standard? We've touched on this before. Maybe yes, maybe not. And how can you determine the time frame for especially a dementia patient? Um, I think it's a little bit more predictable for advanced heart disease or or, or um, cancer than it is for dementia. So CMS, which is their Centers for Medicare, um, actually created criteria for many illnesses, and I'm just going to show you a few because um, they're the ones that are most relevant to us. So 
criteria that they've set aside for determining six-month prognosis for dementia. And I think hospice actually uses these criteria to decide who they'll take and who they won't take. Um, I, I just use my head, like I think you have six months, so I'm going to refer you to hospice, and generally they take the patient, but I think they actually go through these criteria. Um, so you have to have four out of the six of these problems um, to, if you're demented and to say that you have six-month prognosis. So you need assistance with all your ADLs, you're incontinent, you have no meaningful verbal communication. That's pretty advanced right? And um, basically, um, you're becoming bedbound. So it's pretty advanced dementia. Um, and you have to have one of these things in the past or recently. Aspiration pneumonia, urine infection, sepsis, advanced bed sores. Three or four is like uh, uh, down to the muscle, stage three. And four is down to the bone. Uh, recurrent fevers, and so inability, you know, weight loss and uh, other illnesses. So it's pretty sick. Um, now for heart disease, they have other criteria. So you have to have an ejection fraction of less than 20% and some significant symptoms of recurrent heart failure that you've already been optimally treated with diuretics and other medications. Um, so there's many types of pain, and there's a fallacy that pain decreases with aging or that children don't have pain. None of that's, I don't think, true. And, and we have to deal with many types of pain. There's neuropathic pain, somatic pain, cancer pain, emotional pain, and all of these become very important. Um, so non-pain symptom management is also very important. Agitation, anxiety, delirium, depression, constipation, shortness of breath, wounds, spiritual pain, fatigue. So how many, how many times do we think about all this when we're, we have a patient in front of us? Not that, not that much. We're really worried about the acute problem more than we are about all these other things, which is really not enough for us to worry about. We have to worry about all these other things too. So the Family Health Care Decision Act was also introduced, um, well, it was actually introduced a long time ago, but it finally passed in 2010. And it creates a legal mechanism for a surrogate to make decisions for an incapacitated patient who doesn't have a health care proxy. So we already talked about that a little bit, and when there is nobody to be a surrogate, it authorizes the attending physician to act as a surrogate. This is really, really good and big news because before this, these poor people who had nobody were just getting the most aggressive, crazy care. <laughs> and um, everybody afraid of a lawsuit. <laughs> So when is a surrogate needed? When the physician and the concurring healthcare provider determine that the patient lacks capacity for whatever they're asking about. We already discussed that it's this capacity is decision specific. There's no guardian, which is a legally appointed um, person who, if you don't have a family member, um, and it's expensive. So hospitals don't wanna go for guardianship necessarily, and it takes a while. They do if the patient's going to be discharged, but not if the patient's going to be imminently dying. So this is when this is helpful, when a patient's going to be dying in the hospital. And usually, um, you know, I, me as a one, as a physician can't independently say, you know, to withhold or um, life-sustaining treatment or to withdraw life-sustaining treatment. And many people believe that's one and the same, but, there are some cultures that will um, not, once it's there, won't let you withdraw. So there are some nuances, but um, it really requires two physicians. And in some cases, depending on the decision, a committee. So legally appointed guardians are, like surrogates, authorized to make healthcare decisions. And this is the order that we were talking about of uh, it by law of who gets to be appointed the surrogate if there was no healthcare proxy appointed by the patient. 
So number one is if there's a legally, already a legally appointed guardian because somebody maybe is mentally disabled and has a guardian. Um, spouse is, comes next, a son or a daughter, parent, and then a sibling, and then a close friend. These are all, this is a hierarchy, but anyone, like if the spouse says no, ask my daughter, then you just keep going down the line. You don't have to take on this obligation. So the rights of surrogates, so they can get information and medical records to make informed healthcare decisions. So, you know, this HIPAA thing, you know, you can't talk to anybody. So, <laughs> but surrogates, yes. So we're going down the surrogate hierarchy and um, so you get to the first person and say this is the spouse and they say, no, I ask his close friend, he knows him best. No, no, you got to go down you, the order. You have to go down the order? Yeah. Okay. Not so, uh, you as a person appointing a healthcare proxy can appoint whoever you want. But if you haven't done that, you've got to go down the pecking order. Okay. So you want, you want, you're there to help the surrogate make decisions. And there are, there are principles upon which surrogates make decisions. And the first principle is, um, making it based on the known values of the patient. So if hopefully, you know, you would know that. You might know that. You might not know that. You might never have had any conversations or you might at this point be a distant relative or, or an estranged, you know, sibling or something. So then how would you make those decisions if you... There is, um, you can use... Um, Substitute a judgment. You don't want to make it according to your personal beliefs. You want to make it as best as you can to be objective for what you think that patient would have wanted. Or in the end, if you can't come up with anything or you have no idea and you can't figure out anything, you would then make it on the principle of above all, do no harm. But that becomes complicated. <laughs> um, Okay, we already talked about this decisional capacity. And can, can the person express personal references? Can he give reasons for his or her choice? Are there some rational reasons? And do they understand the risks, benefits? And then, as I said before, consistency over time. Um, so these are the other principles I was talking about. If, you're, if you end up being in the surrogate, um, so you would first want to make decisions based on the patient's prior expressed wishes. Maybe they have a living will somewhere, including their religious and moral beliefs. And then if not the best interest principle, consider the patient's dignity, uniqueness of the individual, um, the ability to preserve life and restore health and function and relieve suffering and concerns and values as a reasonable person in similar circumstances would consider. So if you're some kind of fanatic, you're supposed to let that go aside and make reasonable decisions. Um, okay, now, how do we define life-sustaining treatment? So it's any medical treatment or procedure without which the patient will die in a relatively short time, as the doctor says, to a reasonable degree of certainty. We're not able to say that. So sometimes we need, as I mentioned earlier, we need to have um, a subcommittee or to help out in making these decisions for these patients who have no guardian, no surrogate, no healthcare proxy. So, and in the situation of life-sustaining treatments, we, we need two attending physicians and it's required to make it. Now, let's say two people disagree, so then you need to go to a committee. If you have two attendings that disagree, then you have to go to a committee. If you have two attendings that agree, you can sign the paperwork. Okay? Now, um, it's already 5 o'clock, so let me just go to the most important thing. So we talked about the conversation. So you want to have conversations with family members or the patient, and you want to be conscious of their cultural and and their values, and you want to be respectful, and you don't want to have these conversations in the hall. You want to set up a time that's convenient to most people, and you want your beeper on uh, vibrate, and you really you know, tell your friend to hold your beeper. You really want to give this your attention. And you can accomplish a lot in five or 10 minutes if you're not distracted. <laughs> 
And people, there's been studies shown that a doctor spend 10 minutes at the bedside I don't know if 10 minutes, but, but it's a reasonable, a lot of time at the bedside and is fiddling around, talking, you know, playing with papers in their pocket, reading their iPhone. And then they bring another doctor in, spends two minutes, but focusing, talking, making eye contact. The perception of the patient or the family is that the one who spent two minutes spent more time. <laughs> so you don't have to you know, spend your whole day at this. And, you know, you don't have to come to a conclusion. You can say, okay, we'll meet again, or we'll discuss it again, or we'll just, you know, and as I said, we want it, this is a dynamic situation. Um, so you, you first want to establish what people think, what they know, and how they feel, and you go from there. And you, it's mainly to promote dialogue. And here are just some ways to approach it. What's your understanding? What would you like more information about? And, you know, what are you worried about? And blah, blah, and all those kinds of questions. So you take the lead from, you ask leading questions. Um, people want to know, doc, do I have a week? Do I have a month? You don't have to be pressured by that question. You know, you can sidetrack it and say, I can't answer that. I really don't know. Every patient is different. But I feel that, you know, your your mother is quite ill, and I think we need to come to some, you know, understanding of how ill she is and and what, you know, how we should proceed in this situation. But you you don't have to let them box you into a time frame. And they'll try. <laughs> um, so ongoing conversations, range of treatments, always controlling pain. And we do, we do, we can give some prognosis, and there are some scales for different illnesses. Um, but you don't want to say, you never want to get, take away all hope, and you never want to say she will die next week. Boy, you, you just can't be that definitive. Um, this is so, just so funny. So, you know, a resident goes in, doesn't know the family, goes in and says, according to hospital rules, I need to discuss your code status with you. Do you wish to be a full code? Yes or no? Oh, I don't know. I've never thought about this before. I don't want to die. I still have relatively young children. So you want to be a full code? Yes, I guess so. OK. You're laughing. But how many times have you witnessed that conversation? Or how about this one? Do you want us to do everything or nothing? Who's going to say nothing? <laughs> and that's how, you know, oh, no, this family doesn't want to be DNR. I asked them. <laughs> These are okay. So, Mrs. B, hmm. If anything were to happen, do you want us to do everything? I don't understand. Well, if your heart and lungs were to stop, would you want us to use shocks to sort your heart and put you on a breathing machine? I guess so. You mean you want us to jump up and down and break your ribs and put a big plastic tube down your throat and do a lot of aggressive and invasive measures only to have you die in the ICU? <laughs> I guess not. Okay, DNR. <laughs> I didn't make this up. <laughs> so I had a patient, I mean, it, it, it's humorous. I had a patient that I said, do you have diarrhea? And they go, no. So I said, well, do you know what diarrhea is? I mean, this, people's perception of that is very different, you know? I said, no, I, I guess I didn't know what it was, so I figured I don't have it. I mean, the lack of communication on simple matters is, is, is astounding, let alone on this kind of stuff. <laughs> so there's no discussion of goals of care. You know, we often say DNR, and that's the end of the conversation. But that's the beginning of the conversation. We still have the whole goals of care, values, et cetera. Um, so here are some erroneous assumptions, just to sum up. The physician equates not wanting to die to wanting to be resuscitated. That's not true. I don't want to die, but I don't want to be resuscitated necessarily if I'm going to have a poor quality of life. So that's, that, that's just completely illogical. In this case, um, so the patient presumes that doing everything will result in a, this is, this is even more serious. The patient presumes that when they, read, when they said they want everything, that that's going to result in a positive outcome. So the onus is on us to really get this right and explain it correctly to people. 
So um, we talked about that. We talked about all that. So summary of the benefits of the Patient uh, Care Information Act and the Patient Care Access Act. Ensures better communication among healthcare providers, families, surrogates about end-of-life care. Ensures the patients and surrogates are aware of the range of available treatments and services available at the end of life, which we do a very poor job of and improves quality of life of patients, hopefully, striving for the appropriate balance of palliative and curative therapies as the illness progresses. There's, I don't think I have it, but <coughs> Diane Meyer has a curve that, anybody have a pen? It's a very simple curve. I don't think that's a pen, actually. Somebody give me a pen? You can draw on this. Yes. Thank you. It's a very simple curve. It goes like this. So when you're starting out in your illness, you're on you're on this side of the curative curve, and as the illness progresses, you you get more towards palliative care. So it's always a balance between cure and palliative care. But as you get sicker, the balance shifts more to palliative care than curative care. But you can be doing both simultaneously, as we discussed. So it's all a very dynamic situation. Thank you. And I hope that um, I made that kind of clear. OK, any questions? Um, thank you for clarification about the differentiation between hospice and um, palliative care. But where is this that the term comfort care here is when we say comfort care, is it hospice or is it something different? No, it's 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 not. Comfort care is a description of a way to provide care. So, um, it, oh, everybody should be comfortable. <laughs> I don't think it's a medical term. I think we use it um, more like I will say, I, I'm very into something called comfort feeds, for example. So if someone can't, um, a, a advanced dementia patient, who the nurse tells you you can't feed the patient because they're going to aspirate and uh, they don't want a feeding tube. So there is such a thing as comfort feeds. The hospital probably won't let you do it, but we do it at home or hospice will do it, where you can just give them food that um, they may aspirate. They can aspirate with the feeding tube too, but it, it's, it's for their comfort. They like the way it tastes. It keeps their mouth moist. So. So comfort, so any kind of comfort care. So, you know, with patients, we like to keep their mouth moist. We like to keep their bodies clean. We like to keep them in comfortable positions. So that's all so, comfort um, care. Yeah, they have, sorry, they have like some examples kind of. Of um, comfort care? No. They have like a, that has nothing about comfort care. Comfort measures only. You can select oh, 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 okay. So that so means kind of basically what I said, like, only yeah, to keep like, a patient comfortable. Uh, reasonable measures will be made to offer food and fluids, medication, tuning in bed, room care. Right, because uh, those are blood. comfort measures. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, nobody, yeah, taking, you know. Okay. Right, so it's, it's not a, it's anything that it takes yeah, to keep the patient comfortable, care. even if it is a risk that it can, you know, like, I, it, if it's going to keep a patient comfortable to to give, to keep their mouth moist or to give them ice cream and they may do aspirate, that's fine. I mean, the family has to understand what's going on. Yes. But um, that's comfort care. Any other questions? Yes. Um, I have a question about the PCIA and PCAAF. How do you know that you've met their requirements for that? <laughs> Basically, it's very simple. Um, you just have to inform patients that um, they're entitled to palliative care along with their other hospital care. So it's only like an inpatient? Yeah, patient. pretty much, yeah. Um, I think so. And, um, and although I can't swear to that. Um, and that if you say that they're, you know, they, that they have, that you find access you know, not every hospital here in a major medical center here. Not every hospital has palliative care doctors or whatever, or palliative care nurses. So you have to you have to find access to, to services for them if they want it. Like I was curious because in the outpatient setting, when we see patients with dementia, I was like, how can we meet that requirement? Is it just like 
once they get the diagnosis that we have that we have a discussion about goals of care or is it that we have to provide a referral or but I guess no no you can do it yourself it says that you can it's only you only have to refer patients out this is something for all of you not for the next guy as I I think the one of the first things I said is every one of you should 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 discuss palliative care goals of care comfort care all kinds with their patients and not have to refer um, you know, you can certainly refer for pain management. I mean, that's a certain level of expertise, but it's every doctor, it's certainly every primary care doctor's job, maybe not the surgeon so much, but uh, to certainly a primary care doctor's job to, to have these conversations. Um, okay. Thank Sorry, yeah, no. down the order, and we have the, to, to have like a, a son or a daughter, it makes the decision for the patient. But there are like four or five of them. And they're arguing. <laughs> do, you, do you jump to the next, or you have to choose somebody, or go with the age? Uh, we, we I'm going to guess, I can't say 100%, that you go with the age. But do you know? Um, because I remember we had a patient where actually one of the daughters was the one who was taking care of the father. It's a, it's a big problem it's that you bring up, yeah. yeah. Even without, um, in general, where children disagree on the care of the parent. So, you know, my general approach to that is um, to try to bring everyone in and try to sort of talk to them about coming together for this situation in some way, um, focusing on what the parent would have wanted, not focusing on their own personal beliefs. And we run into it's a tremendous problem that you bring up, and um, there's no easy answer. And just if you say, okay, by law, it's you because you're older, you know, it doesn't really solve the problem for the family and for making a, a good death for that patient. So I try to, you know, bring every, and use resources to help me, you know, like the hospital social worker or different people. I mean, you're not, you're not alone. It, it does require a team in these complex situations. Um, okay, okay, thank you. Oh, okay. <laughs>